thank you so much for having me back again this year. I'm glad to hear there was positive feedback after my talk last year. Upon reflection, uh, I threw a lot at you guys last year because uh, I was very excited to just, I don't know, share a lot of what goes into the fine mechanics of logic with you. Now this year, uh, Jeremy had a much more specific request. So it's going to be a lot more application based and we're going to hone in and focus on a particular application of logic, particularly as it applies to memes and really any kind of argumentation you encounter when bad persuasion is happening. So how you can be able to detect when persuasion is not necessarily operating the way that it really ought to be. Uh, and specifically, uh, as we're looking at memes, understand that it also applies more broadly, too. So uh, I'm excited. I think we can have some fun with it today. So meme busting. Reclaiming rhetoric on social media. I will have little memes interspersed even on my title page. I wanted to throw you guys familiar with that the baby with the <laughs> All right, so he's saying yes, we're going to reclaim rhetoric today is what I'm Winnie. I'm hoping. Yeah, exactly so um, So before we go into this uh, I want to talk about well, what are memes? So just to be clear that we're kind of on the same page and well, what do I mean when I use this term? Some of the slides will be a little wordy like this, but most of them won't be, so, so don't, be af don't be afraid <laughs> yet. So definition, this is a definition actually that I found that I thought was helpful. Uh, it's an activity, a concept, catchphrase, or a piece of media which spreads often as mimicry or for comedic purpose purposes from person to person. Now typically when we see a meme, it's kind of like that picture on my title page. You've got some photo or some, you know, screen saved shot of a movie or a television show or even just some random photo that someone pulled from somewhere of some baby squeezing sand in his fist, whatever it might be. And then it's got an associated caption, right? What's interesting is there's a couple of purposes that memes are used for. The first one I've got up there is entertainment. A lot of memes that you come across, they're just for fun, right? You just look at it, you laugh, it's you know, through some shared experience or through some common understanding that you know, maybe we as humans or we as Americans or we as you know, this generation of peers understand and enjoy. But what I'm talking more about today is not necessarily the memes that you used for entertainment, but the ones that you used for persuasion. Because memes can also be used persuasively. They can be used to alter your attitude. They can be used to you know, get you to view something differently maybe than the way that you viewed it before. So uh, just a few minutes ago before I got started, I got asked, you know, are, are you against memes? Are you here to, to bash memes? It's, that's not really why I'm here. I, what I'm saying is there is a distinction. You know, I am all for entertaining memes and getting to look through them and laughing at them. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a great credit to me or a huge merit, but... <laughs> But I'm not against memes. I'm, I'm actually, you could say, maybe very pro-meme. Uh, but what I'm looking at is when memes are being used persuasively, how can they be used persuasively? How can you start to detect and understand this meme is actually trying to get into my consciousness or my subconsciousness and alter my attitude or my thought or my opinion of something? Because sometimes that happens without us realizing it. It's very subtle. And if you're not looking for it, and if your eye isn't trained to see it, then you might miss it. So, you know, again, my talk last year was about all the different nuances that go into logic because it's a very complex and complicated mechanic of our minds. So we're going to look into a little bit of that today. Now, another thing I wanted to say is I'm not quite talking about political cartoons because those are similar. They're, you know, a kind of illustrated media that's used to influence your attitude. Some memes work similarly to political cartoons, but that's not really what I'm talking about today. Although, uh, so real quick though, how many of you have learned about political cartoons in social studies or you know, history class? Yeah, so similar. Memes can be used in a similar way to kind of alter your way of thinking or persuade you to see something in a certain way. Yeah? Could memes also persuade you in a positive way? They could. They could. So when I say persuasive, I'm not necessarily saying that it's only persuading you in negative ways. But know that it is going to try to alter your thinking. Maybe it's for better, maybe it's for worse. So I, the first thing I have here is a political cartoon. So you know, kind of what I mean is you know, something that's been sketched out and drawn. And you can see this is meant to influence one's attitude one way or the other. You've got two booths. The booth on the left has a cross, and atop it, it's written comforting lies. And the other booth to the right says science, 
and on the top of it says unpleasant truths and you have this long line of people behind the booth on the left. So it's pretty clear the statement that that's seeking to make, right? Is anyone confused about what this political cartoon is trying to say? <laughs> so when we're looking at these today, whether it's a meme or a political cartoon like it is right now, I'm not necessarily concerned on do you agree or do you disagree with its message. What we're looking at is how is it sending a message? How is it trying to send a message to get you to think one way or the other? So you've got your memes for entertainment, and this is maybe a common one that you've seen, the Leonardo DiCaprio, Great Gatsby, holding up his glass to you, saying, ah, here's to all the memes that make us smile. Cheers to us for all of those fun memes. That is a very common one that I feel like I've seen a lot. This isn't being used persuasively, right? It's just being used to kind of celebrate together, saying, hey, we all love memes, they're fun. This one is the same picture, but it's got a different caption, and it's actually trying to influence your attitude one way or the other. It says, to the people who would rather lose honestly than win by cheating. So is anyone in here a board game player or an athlete or you know, playing any games of any kind? Is anyone here cheating those games? <laughs> <laughs> if you'll admit it. So, does anyone in here despise when people cheat in those games? Yeah. Right. So this meme is speaking against the cheaters, right? Saying, hey, you know, those of you that cheat, what's that? Good. Yeah, that is good. So, what I'm saying here is it's trying to, in a sense, shame the people who aren't cheating and celebrate, I'm, I'm sorry, shame the people who are cheating and celebrate the people who play honestly. Right, so it's saying, cheers to you. Let's raise a glass to all of the people that play honestly and with integrity and, and don't cheat in the board games or in the athletic games and so forth. So I wanted to use that to draw the distinction. Same picture, right, the exact same photo. One of them was used just for fun, for entertainment, back here. And then the other one is used to start trying to make a point. It's really trying to make a statement. So it's trying to say something and influence one's attitude away from cheating and toward playing honestly. So before we really get into the meat of today's talk, I want to ask you guys a few questions uh, because these are the questions that I hope to answer by the end, but I want to kind of see where we're at now. So the first is what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is probably a term you've heard before, especially someone like me who's in the educational sphere, it's talked about a lot. You know, a lot of schools say, well, we're here to promote and encourage and teach students how to think critically. But what does that even mean? Does anyone have an idea? Yes. Um, thinking, beyond the surface and stuff. thinking beyond the surface. Good. Other thoughts? Yes. Uh, thinking using logic and not logical fallacies. Thinking using good logic versus logical fallacies. Uh, actually putting in deeper thoughts into harder questions. Putting deeper thought into a harder question. Ah, being able to criticize or critique something that you even personally believe. Good. These are very good thoughts. Yes? Not taking something at face value. Not taking something just at its face value. Good. Excellent. So the definition I tend to like to use for critical thinking, and that's one of the things we're looking at here, is it's really being able to think for yourself. You don't need anyone else to do your thinking for you. You don't need anyone else to tell you what to believe. You can actually look at something and evaluate it for yourself. You can actually see what makes it up and determine is it worth accepting or ought I to reject it. And critical thinking is it's very important. So what we're doing here when we're talking about you know meme busting and getting to use some logical techniques to evaluate is a meme trying to influence my attitude or my opinion? That even there is critical thinking because now it's not something that's just subconsciously getting into your psyche you are filtering that. Or you're looking at it and saying, well, wait, is this meme persuading me positively or negatively? And you can now make that decision. Because like we said, sometimes it's good. And so if it just reaches into your subconscious and positively shapes your opinion, that's not a bad thing. But really, you should be making those decisions, right? I think that's what this camp is all about, gaining tools so that you yourself can decide, is this philosophy, is this ideology worth accepting or ought I to reject it and actually having the ability to do that for yourself. So two other quick questions before we go. What is argument and what is rhetoric? 
So we're going to deal with each of those separately. So first, what is argument? Yes. Argument is two people disagreeing and having a conversation about what they disagree upon. So two people disagreeing and having a conversation about what they disagree upon. Other thoughts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Argument. So typically the first thing we think of when we think of argument is two people having a disagreement, right? A conflict where, you know, one person believes this, the other believes that, and it becomes, you know, a conflict that could, you know, maybe can remain civil, or maybe it's going to blow up into a big dramatic thing. Or we have argument where it's really just involving one person who has a position or who has a claim and they're trying to back it up. Now logically, argument is simply understood not necessarily ne needing to involve two people and not necessarily needing to involve a conflict of interest, but actually a set of statements wherein one appears to be implied by the others. It means that someone is backing up a position with evidence, with argumentation, with logic, and with the tools of rhetoric oftentimes. And logic is actually one of the tools of rhetoric. So it's a part of it. They're not even separate things. So that gets to our next question. So if that's what argument is, actually taking a claim and giving all the reasons why it ought to be accepted, basically, what is rhetoric? You may have heard this term before. Back there, yeah. The art of speaking to others. I'm sorry? The art of speaking to others? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, art of the, good man speaking well. the art of the good man speaking well. You've read Quintilian, haven't you? <laughs> yes. The art of communication. The art of communication. So as we see, it has to do with speaking. It has to do with communicating. It has to do with speaking well. So Quintilian was an ancient rhetorician, and he says that rhetoric is the good man speaking well. And uh, so... As it was said before, I'm a logic and rhetoric teacher at Providence, and in my rhetoric class, we don't quite get to Quintilian, and yet we're reading Aristotle, and I really like his uh, definition for it as well, which we'll get to in a little bit. But what we're going to talk about first is what makes up argumentation, how does that apply to memes, what makes up good rhetoric, and how does that apply to memes. Those are the two main things that we're looking at here today. So I'll give you com more complete answers to these questions here in just a little bit. And we'll also talk about how the term rhetoric is used a little differently today than it was understood in ancient times. And so, of course, when I mean it, I mean it as the ancients understood it, as true and pure rhetoric actually is. But before we really jump in today, uh, I want to make sure that we're kind of checking our hearts and checking our attitudes, because when it comes to me equipping you guys to recognize bad argumentation, the temptation is to, all right, now I'm the police, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start picking out every single person I find online and in person who's arguing badly, and I'm going to knock them down. That's the temptation. That is not my goal here. That is not my goal. So, I have Matthew 7, 1 through 6. It's part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So, my point may already be very clear to you. My goal here today is not to first equip you so you can go out and police the world of bad logic. My first goal is for you to correct your own poor persuasive habits. We all have bad habits. And I talked about this last year that we typically learn logic, rhetoric, and the tools of that by observing people around us arguing. 
But here's the, the sad fact is most of the people that surround us that argue aren't arguing well. They have a lot of bad habits. Some of them have pretty good habits. So we pick up the good habits along with the bad. When we look around and we pick up, you know, okay, I guess that's how you argue or that's how you reason well. And that's why I'm particularly passionate about teaching logic and rhetoric because we talk about these are what the good habits are and these are the habits we need to build. So my first goal with you today is for you to take the log out of your own eye. Then, maybe then, you might be ready to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. But first and foremost today, as I'm going over things, you need to look inwardly, not think, oh, I know who needs to hear this. You need to hear this. You first. Once you've really searched yourself, once you've looked through and said, all right, do I do that bad thing? Do I use this bad mode of persuasion? If you can find any error and correct it and repent of it, then you ought to do that, and now you're ready to go out and maybe gently and winsomely and instructively correct other people. So that's my first goal for you guys. Now the other thing that's interesting in this passage at the end when it says don't give dogs what is holy and do not cast pearls before pigs, what I'm giving to you is what good argumentation and good rhetoric looks like. There will still be people in the world that don't recognize it, that don't see the value of it. Even once you look inwardly, correct all of your bad persuasion, become masters of logic and rhetoric and go out into the world as you know, amazingly perfect evangelists and apologists, there will still be people that no matter how good of an arguer you are, no matter how winsomely you are arguing and how much you are loving your neighbor, they will still hate you for it. They will still despise you for it. They will still turn to attack you. So understand that, that no matter how good you get, reason alone will never convert the heart. Reason apart from faith is not enough to you know, bring someone into the gospel, that that's an act of God. But reason can be a great tool for you to grow more established in your faith and to be a bridge to bring someone over. So, purposes of discourse. This is where I want to start again, is this is what good discourse should look like. First, it should be cooperation to arrive at and share truth, as opposed to arguing just to win the argument. If you're just trying to win the argument, you might lose the person in the process, and that's not our goal. So you want to win the person, not the argument. You want to cooperate together to arrive at truth in the end. It's not about being right, it's about discovering the truth and winning the person. Practicing good reasoning skills through dialectic. So dialectic is dialogue, the back and forth of argumentation. That's the actual exchange. So what we're learning here today a good discourse could be a place where you can practice these habits and build better habits of persuasion. Introspection on issues in which you may not otherwise be challenged, especially if you are arguing with someone who believes very differently than you do. Arguing with them, hearing a different perspective, can be a healthy and a good thing. To sit there and listen to, okay, they believe something vastly different than I believe, they're giving me their reasons to believe. It doesn't mean you have to be persuaded of their position, but it can be a very good and a very stimulating exercise. And then the last thing is unity and kindness in the face of disagreement, meaning that you can have an argument with someone, still disagree at the end, and still be friends. That You can still actually behave civilly with one another. Uh, have any of you ever seen the documentary uh, entitled Collision with Doug Wilson and uh, Christopher Hitchens? I would highly recommend that. It's a beautiful picture of two men who believe vastly, vastly different things. Doug Wilson, a very uh, conservative Christian, and uh, Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, who was a very staunch advocate for atheism. They did a tour around the United States, and this documentary of the, is of their tour, talking about how, uh, answering this question, is Christianity good for the world? And they both had totally different answers to that question. They would get up, and they would have these fiery debates and then they'd get off the stage at the end and they'd go and grab a meal together and jovially hang out together. They were re actually really good friends and had a very healthy friendship, even though they believed vastly different things. And I thought it was a beautiful picture because these days we think if someone disagrees with me, well then, I mean, we just can't even talk. We just can't even associate with one another. And that's actually very far from the truth. That is, uh, that's a lie. Another illustration is, my wife and I, we don't agree on everything. We definitely have our disagreements. We agree on the fundamental and most important things, 
But there are other little things here and there that we disagree with. And yet not only can we still associate with each other, we can live together, we can raise a child together, we can enjoy every day together, even though we have disagreements as well. So know that this is what civil and good discourse looks like. Some problems with modern discourse that I've recognized and that perhaps you've recognized. First, little to no training in how to dialogue well. So a few things that I put that go into that. So many don't know the art of reason or of rhetoric. So good training in logic and rhetoric is a dying art. I teach at a classical Christian school. That's why we have those classes there, because most schools have done away with logic class, rhetoric class, teaching you and training you with the tools that you need to reason well. Uh, not taught how to be a good listener. Being a good listener sometimes is the very best place to start. Actually sitting and listening to someone and keeping your own mouth shut and actually hearing what they have to say, what the other person has to say. Many people are very bad at listening today. Uh, a sense of entitlement rather than responsibility. So seeing that you have a social responsibility where other people feel, well, I am entitled to be listened to, I am entitled to be heard, I am entitled to this, and because of that, we become bad listeners and we become poor arguers. Or rather, we need to see ourselves as, I'm responsible to be a good arguer. I'm responsible to be a servant and to love my neighbor. Those are the things that are really important. Uh, and then oversimplification uh, in our social media age with Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and little sound bites even on you know, YouTube, most arguments are presented as memes, tweets, and video clips, and they attempt to reduce complex issues into very black and white issues. When most of the issues we're talking about today, the really hot topics, are very complex, highly nuanced, and involve a lot more twists and turns than most little memes will present them as. They're usually not quite as simple as that. Yes? What memes would you be, I don't want to put like different people like people, mm -hmm. like, what would you be referring to exactly? Because I look at a lot of memes and I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to get to. So I'm kind of giving you the information here at the front, kind of front loading this here, and then we're going to look at some memes and talk about exactly what I mean. So great question. So. Social media bar barrier also, I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about social media because I know the speaker after me is going to be specifically talking about social media, but there is a barrier there. People will say things to other people on social media that they would never say to that person's face. You see what someone writes in a comment section and think if that person was face to face with the person they're addressing, would they have the gumption and, and be able to be that cruel looking that person in the eye? I pray that they would not <laughs> be able to. And then public shaming and intimidation. That's a big one I'm going to talk about is that both sides typically resort to sarcastic and sharp declarations rather than sound dialogue. And even if your reasoning is sound, presenting it with cruelty pollutes the whole discourse. So most of the time people aren't going for good reasoning. They're just trying to shame or intimidate other people into their way of thinking rather than trying to win them over with reason. Now again, we look at these points and we think, yep, I see that all the time online. I see that happening, ha happens here and that person and this. Think about yourself for just a second. Think, okay, where am I not very well trained in good discourse? Where can I be growing in that area? Where can I be getting better? How do I oversimplify very complex issues in order to make the argument easier on myself? How do I use that social media barrier to not love my neighbor well? Where am I guilty of that? And when am I trying to use shaming or intimidation rather than good reason with other people? So again, that's the first thing that I want you to think of is, are you guilty of this? You don't have to share that with me. You don't have to share that with anyone, but you need to recognize that. Right? That's the first place because you're not ready to start approaching you know, a means of correcting these things and others until you correct them in yourself. So. Argument then. We're going to talk about argument, talk about rhetoric, and then we're going to look at some memes. So what is argument logically? It's a set of statements wherein one appears to be implied by the others. Something that I wanted to just kind of have as a side note to our discussion here today is there are two kinds of argument, two kinds of reason. There's inductive reasoning and there's deductive reasoning. And I think it's important to understand that distinction because they lead you to different kinds of conclusions. Inductive reasoning is based on this. It's based on observation. You look around, you notice patterns, 
You notice trends. From those trends, you draw conclusions. So here's an example. It's a very simple example. If someone knocks on my door at my house, the first thing I do is I grab my dog and I put her in her kennel because I've noticed time and time again, if I go and open up that door, she's going to jump all over the guests, whoever they are. doesn't matter who they are. And she's being friendly. She is aggressively affectionate. And I know that. So I say, I'm going to grab her and I'm going to put her in her kennel because I am predicting, based on the trend that I have seen, based on this pattern of behavior, she's going to jump on the guests. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to put her away. She just needs a couple minutes to get used to the idea that someone else is in the house. And then I can let her out and she can more gently greet our guest. That's inductive reasoning. Now here's the weakness with inductive reasoning. See, it's not a bad mode of reasoning. Sometimes it's all we have on hand. All we have is our observation, our senses. But the weakness is it's based on probabilities. On its best day, your strongest conclusion is only highly probable. It's never certain. Because there might be that one day that I go and I open the door and my dog just sits there like a good dog, just wagging her tail, looking at the guests. That might happen. So it's highly probable that she's going to jump all over them. But at the same time, it's not certain. It's not a certainty. There are going to be exceptions. So that's what inductive reasoning is. And actually, most modern science is through inductive reasoning. Because kind of like uh, I, I got to be here for a little bit of your lecture on uh, Tuesday morning, talking about science and the gospel, which is better, and that science is based on observation. Science is based on finite human limitations in our sensibilities. And you can discover much through that. But it's important to note that through inductive reasoning alone, you cannot reach 100% certainty. Deduction, on the other hand, you can reach 100% certainty. And that's what I talked about last year was the mechanics of deductive logic, where you take a given truth, an absolute authoritative truth, that's handed down to you from scripture or handed down to you from some other reliable authoritative source. And then you apply that truth argumentatively to discover other truths. That's what deduction is. And if you are validly connecting one premise onto another premise, your conclusion can be accepted as absolutely true if all of the premises leading up to it were also absolutely true. So deductive reasoning is the other mode. So those are two kinds of reasoning and they're both necessary in logic and in rhetoric because sometimes we don't have a given truth on the given issue. So we can't deduce our way into a certain conclusion. So then we have induction. We can look around, we can observe, and we can start to draw some conclusions that way. But when deduction is available, you have a 100% guaranteed answer at the end. And so if you recall, my big conclusion last year was those who do not accept absolute truths. So someone who has a more relativist outlook that says nothing is absolutely true, they cannot use deductive reasoning because deductive reasoning requires an absolute truth where inductive reasoning is all they have. So then they can never reach any certainties of any kind. So that's just an interesting side note. Let that, you know, fill your brain for a second there. Uh, not sure if deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. Hopefully that's not you now. Now you can know the, the basic answer to that is, how are they trying to argue? Are, is their conclusion based on observation or is their conclusion based on given authoritative truths? Sherlock Holmes, you know, he's considered very uh, famous for his use of deduction, which actually, based on what I've just talked about, what Sherlock Holmes does is observation. So it's actually more like induction than it is like deduction. So <coughs> here's my point though. When we talk about argumentation, there's deduction, there's induction. Here's a meme that's seeking to be persuasive. What if I told you there's more to atheism than quoting famous people disagreeing with religion? <laughs> so some of you might know this. This movie, I guess, from the 90s now, isn't it? Uh, the Matrix. So you've got Morpheus then they're, they're trying to echo what he said in the film, you know, what if I told you that everything you know isn't, you know, real? What if I told you, so it's trying to be persuasive. And it's trying to persuade, what is it trying to say? What is it trying to get you to think? Yeah. That the way that they're arguing atheism, right, 
is just by throwing quotes out that disagree with religion from different authoritative sources. Now here's the interesting thing that I want to illustrate with this meme and the memes that it's referring to, right? The memes that just throw out a quote and say, all right, take it or leave it. This is not argumentation. I told you an argument is collecting facts and support and evidence and using that inductively or deductively to reach a conclusion. Memes are not argumentative. They're not collecting information and using it to support. They're just throwing a claim out there, putting a picture on it to give it a particular tone or voice associated with it now, and that's it. And they're saying, take my word for it. They're not actually trying to persuade you through argumentation. So there's a difference. This is what I want you to see. There's a difference between argumentation and persuasion. You can try to persuade people without using any argumentation. And that's what memes do. The persuasive memes, right? The persuasive memes are not using argumentation. So all of that to say, now you know what good argumentation looks like, memes aren't that. Memes aren't argumentative, but they are persuasive. So I'm not really going to be using the term argument anymore. I'm going to be using the term persuasion and persuasive because there are other ways to persuade people other than just argumentation and logic. Here's another one, non-argumentative. What it's got is a picture, right? It's got three equally sized pictures with three figures. Below that, all caps, mythology. And then below that, it's got a subtitle. Today it's religion, tomorrow it's fable. Notice the pictures. I think that one on the far left is Ra, the Egyptian god Ra, the sun god. The middle clearly is Zeus, the Greek god Zeus. And then on the right is a depiction of Jesus. So notice how the pictures are all lined up, equal size. There's an equation being made, right? These three are meant to be counted as equal. Under that, mythology is their label. They are myth. And then below that saying today, or today it's religion, tomorrow it's fable. So there's a statement being made, and the statement is quite clear, I think. What is the statement being made particularly? Yes? That they're all not true. That they're all not true. And the particular one they want to point to that would be more um, controversial is Jesus, right? That Jesus, is he a myth or was he a real man? And, you know, if he even was a real man, did he really do the things that people believe he did? And it's trying to raise all these questions. But my point is this, that's not argumentative. It's persuasive. It's trying to be persuasive, but not through argumentation, through something else. It's trying to persuade you through some other means other than logic, other than argumentation. And that's the big thing we need to be on our guard for. So that brings us to rhetoric. Because like I said, logic is just one component of rhetoric. It's the other components of rhetoric that people are using persuasively. Yes. Wasn't that last one at least a little bit argumentative in that it, it brought forth three things ah. to try to show a progression? That's good. So it was. It is actually getting much closer to argumentation than this one is. But it is actually starting to rally a few things. It? Yeah. <laughs> it's a poor argument, but it is more argumentative. Typically, there's not going to be as much cooperating bits of information in a meme than that, but I'm really glad that you pointed that out. I was wondering if anyone was going to catch that there is some argumentation there, but typically what you're going to find in a meme is minimal to none. Yes? In a meme, isn't it more like a belief rather than an argument? <coughs> Very good. That in logic we talk about there's a difference between a statement and an argument. That a statement could be a statement of belief, and a statement is either true or false. An argument is a collection of statements, They're either valid or invalid, the way that it's structured together. Most memes are just throwing out a statement. It's either true or it's false, but they're not arguing it. They're just saying, accept it, take my word for it. And uh, I, I have a few students in here, and they may you know, have experienced this with me because I also teach composition, so writing, and we have to write argumentative essays. And if their point to support their thesis doesn't have any evidence to back it up, I write in there and say, hey, you just want me to take your word for it? You're, you're a seventh grader. I'm not going to take your word for it. I'm not going to just look at that and say, oh, well, you know, they said I ought to believe it, so I'm going to believe it. And I give it back and say, no, we need to practice pulling in evidence, pulling in information to support that, something other than your seventh grade experience, something beyond that. So 
that ultimately an argument is bringing in more of that information. But most memes are just saying, take my word for it. Just take my word for it. So rhetoric. Rhetoric, the modern understanding, is that it's simply a manipulation of facts and data to coerce an audience into one's way of thinking. Most of the time you're going to hear this term is if you're watching the news and they're talking about some political party or they're talking about some movement or some organization. They're going to say, oh, well, that's just the rhetoric of the left or that's the rhetoric of the right. That's just the conservative rhetoric. That's just the liberal rhetoric. And what they mean by that is that's just their way of coercing people into their way of thinking, manipulating the facts, manipulating the data. And that's not much more than what people mean when they use the term rhetoric today. Now, Rhetoric as it was classically understood, and I particularly like what Aristotle gets at, is he says, it is the faculty of, in any given case, detecting the available means of persuasion. So let me unpack that for you. The faculty of, so the skill, the ability, in any given case, so at any time, with any issue, with any discussion, detecting the available means of persuasion discovering any evidence, any facts, any observations, any absolute truths that are reasons to hold a position. So that rhetoric is knowing what you believe and why you believe it. Being able to actually articulate and put into words why a position is worth holding. That's critical thinking. Like I said, the critical thinking is thinking for yourself so that you don't just hold a position because, well, it just feels right. No, you hold the position because you have actually observed all of the evidence that exists for all the positions that existed on the issue and said, I found this one to be the most compelling. This position had the most persuasive, compelling evidence, and I can stand firmly footed in it and believe it, and I can share that evidence with other people. And that's what rhetoric is, is when you're seeking to persuade an audience by articulating those facts for another person. So that's what rhetoric is. And in the classical world, it was highly, highly regarded because language, rhetoric, is the epitome of language. It's being able to use language powerfully and persuasively and poetically in all realms of life. So people would pursue rhetoric because they wanted to achieve this thing as the greatest human achievement, that language is a unique gift to man from God. You see, other creatures and beings on the earth do not have language like man does. Man has language with a very complex grammar. We can create abstract thoughts and ideas through our language. We can create stories and poetry, and we can imagine things that aren't even real and communicate them to other people through language. That language is a very special gift and a unique gift from God to humankind. That God specially revealed himself to us through language, through his word. That God spoke the world into being. That language is a very special thing. So if, if you weren't convinced already, that's my use of rhetoric to you and that language is a pretty big deal. So people would pursue rhetoric and pursue the mastery of language in this way. So what I've got here on the left are the five canons of rhetoric. The first one up there is invention. That is simply finding proper premises. So that's the act in the definition of detecting the available means of persuasion. Actually stepping back and saying, okay, here's the issue. Here are the different beliefs on the issue. Here are the different reasons why one would hold each of these beliefs. So what we do in my rhetoric class is we create which, what's called an Annie chart. And I am actually going to use the board after all. And we consider, and I say to the students, before you even select what your position is going to be on this issue, you have to think through the affirmative side, that's the A, and the negative side, the N. And I'll get to the I in a second. But you have to think through what information exists that supports the affirmative side of the issue. And we'll practice this with something super basic, like in the Chronicles of Narnia, should Edmund have followed the White Witch? Well, let's consider it. Well, there were reasons why he should. She had candy. <laughs> as petty as it seems, he followed her. There must have been some reasons to follow her. She promised him he would be a prince. He was upset with his siblings. 
So there's information because you would look at that issue and say, well, of course he shouldn't have. First of all, she's a witch. You don't follow witches in strange places in the snow. But if you're cold and you don't have a coat, maybe you do. And then you think through, of course, the negative reasons, like she's a witch, she's a stranger, and so on and so forth. But that is invention. You actually think through what are the reasons for holding the affirmative position? What are the reasons for holding the negative position? And you're not just going with your gut. It's funny, most of the time we use reason in our lives, it's to support the position we already hold. We already picked a position based on our gut, based on our feelings, and then we came up with a bunch of reasons to justify that because we wanted to seem more reasonable. Even though our decision wasn't based on rationality, it was based on instinct. Reason says you should consider both sides. Now, more often than not, you're going to end up falling on the side you would have originally fallen on, but you'd be surprised that when you consider the case on the other side of a particular issue, how Wow, actually, there's some decent evidence to support it. The second is arrangement. Once you actually come up with these ideas and then you select your position, you order out that information in a particular way. You might say, you know what? I am going to go with the affirmative position, but I'm going to leave out the candy part because that seems dumb. That's okay. That's what arrangement is for, is starting to make some of those decisions so that when you're presenting, it's more eloquent. And then you get to elocution, which is choosing the words. Once you've organized your information, you choose the words to present it with clarity, with naturalness, with appropriation, with originality. Then, once those words are chosen, you commit them to memory. You came up with those words, commit them to memory so that they dwell with you always, so that in any given case, you can detect those available means of persuasion. And then finally, delivery. You would actually get up without a paper in front of you, no podium, no nothing. You would present the compelling language that you have developed based on this process. But that's what classical rhetoric was. And people would strive to be masters of this. And they would go through this entire process for all kinds of issues. Now what I want to focus more time on, on the right, are the appeals of rhetoric. And you might have heard of these before. Logos, pathos, and ethos. That is where we start getting to the memes now. So Logos is what I talked about last year. Logic, reason, the intellect. Of course, when you are developing argumentation rhetorically, you have to appeal to the person's intellect. You can't leave that part out. That's super important. For some of us, that ends up being the only part that we appeal to. But there's two other appeals that need to be made. Not just the intellect, but also the pathos, the emotion, the heart. You have to appeal to the heart because you're not talking to computers, you're not talking to robots, you are talking to people, human beings that feel a certain way toward an issue and you can't help that. But that's good. That's all part of being human. Now it doesn't mean that all feelings are justified now and all feelings are good at all subjects, but we ought to hate wicked things. We ought to love good things, right? There are good manifestations of feelings toward their appropriate object. And then finally, ethos, the character of the speaker. So again, if rhetoric is the good man speaking well, you speak well by appealing to the mind and heart, but it's important to be of good moral character because you need to have the trust of your audience. Jeremy read my little bio before that to build my ethos, right? So that you know, okay, well, okay, this guy, he did go to college and he's a teacher and, you know, he's done this and that before. But that can give you a bit of background to hopefully build a little bit of trust in my authority up here, right? If I'm going to talk to you about this, do I even know what I'm talking about? Well, hopefully. But that's what ethos is. Can you actually trust on the authority of the person? So that's what goes into rhetoric. My little remote go. Here we go. But one does not simply make one appeal without the other two. This is a meme of my own creation. I was kind of proud of it. <laughs> I don't think you're going to find that one. But that's my point. Most memes leave out the logos. Some of them might incorporate a little bit of logos, but they completely leave out the logos most of the time and just appeal to the pathos or just the ethos. And that's kind of the big idea here as we start to get to how memes operate non-argumentatively but still operate persuasively. 
So appeals to pathos or ethos exclusively. So exclusive pathos means that they're just appealing to your emotions, just to your heart. They're leaving the mind out of it. They're leaving out their own moral character as well. So good pathos. So pathos has a place. Good pathos should be illustrative. It uses an illustration to elicit appropriate and natural feelings. So if you're talking about an issue, you illustrate where the issue is present. And if it is something that is wicked and evil, it should stir people up to despise it. If it is something that is good and desirable, that ought to be chased after, that is righteous and holy, we ought to start manifesting affection and love for that thing. That is good pathos, starting to feel rightly toward the right object. Bad pathos seeks to manipulate you into feeling afraid or ashamed to coerce. So if the speaker is trying to make you feel afraid, or if they're trying to make you feel shame, they are not using good pathos because they're trying to coerce you and twist your arm into believing something or accepting something rather than treating you with dignity and letting you come to your own conclusions. Again, do you do this? Rather than treating the other person with dignity, trying to winsomely shepherd them into truth, are you just trying to twist their arm, trying to scare them, trying to intimidate them, trying to make them feel ashamed, and through that, win them over? Exclusive ethos. Good ethos comes from one of good moral character and poised delivery, so that the speaker is authoritative and qualified, and when they get up in front of you, they look authoritative and qualified. You know, you might have someone who has all the credentials in the world, but no public speaking ability, and you're probably not going to give them much attention. You need to have good ethos to get the attention of the audience. Bad ethos is relying just on that. You have charisma, and you have a good reputation, so you get up there and you use that, but you don't use any logic, you don't appeal to their hearts, you just say, hey, just take my word for it, because I look good, don't I? And that's it. So charismatic speakers, someone who gets up and they can really captivate an audience but completely throw good reasoning and good pathos out the door, ought not to be listened to just for that. And this is why, without the other appeals, you only have a short-term win. It, without Logos, if you're not appealing to their intellect and using logic, it's not going to be a lasting win. Meaning that eventually, when they walk out of that room, and start to really think about what you said, they'll realize what you said didn't make any sense. And they'll say, well, that was garbage, never mind, and they'll forget it. If you try to argue without pathos, if you don't actually appeal to the heart, they will not be moved to action. Ultimately, when you're using rhetoric, you're trying to move the audience to action. You can appeal to their intellect well and convince them intellectually, and they say, hmm, interesting, yes, I like it, and then they walk away unchanged. You have to actually get them emotionally involved. You have to get their affections fostered for the good things and get them to despise the wicked things. And then, if you don't have ethos, if you don't have any sort of winning speaking ability, then your audience will hardly pay any attention to you. And so it doesn't matter how good your logos is or how good your pathos was, the audience wasn't paying attention and it was lost. So. That's what we're talking about here. We're going to look at a couple of examples of memes that just appeal to either pathos or ethos pretty much exclusively. So on the left, we have this, makes another pointless meme bashing religion, somehow thinks condescending and sarcastic attitude will somehow prove his point. Now, first of all, as a composition teacher, I have a problem with somehow, somehow. Just use that word once, pick where it's going to go already. But that meme is interesting. I love the irony of it. I don't know if you note the irony of it. It's using a sarcastic and condescending attitude to discredit memes that use sarcastic and condescending attitudes. I think it's actually kind of funny how ironic that is. But the tone is set by the picture, right? Because that's how the meme works. You give this guy with the raised eyebrow, and the tone of how you read the text now is set to that sarcastic, condescending tone. Yes? Ah. Yeah, is that a meta meme? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. It depends. Are we giving too much credit to the, the meme maker? Or are they, were they really thinking on all those levels at once? I'm not quite sure. But what I want you to see is 
what appeal is it making? What's the exclusive appeal that it's making? Can you see that? I'll help you along with this first one. It's appealing just to your pathos. It's trying to make you feel ashamed. It's trying to make the reader of that, if they are the ones making memes bashing religion with a sarcastic, condescending attitude, it's trying to shame those people. This meme is saying, you who use the shameless, condescending, sarcastic memes, shame on you. Shame on you for doing that. Now, it's not building an argument. It's just saying, how dare you? That's terrible. And that's it. That's kind of the end of the conversation. The one on the right. So you're telling me you wash your plates with clean water because there's still food on it? <laughs> I like that one. Have you guys seen this picture before and different memes generated with this with the sidelong glance kid saying, whoa, what? It's kind of your first world, third world encounter in a sense. You can see based on the frame of the picture, you begin to assume that, okay, this girl on the left with her fancy sunglasses and her clean hair, she's someone coming from a much more wealthy background, and she's encountering this kid, and he's giving her a look like, whoa, do you even understand the, the wide, you know, kind of socioeconomic gap between the two of us here? As she's looking at him, and they have all of these different captions I've seen where they're all of the same, you know, stream of thought. Kind of this, you have clean water, and you use that clean water to wash food off of your plate because you had too much food on your plate. But again, this is an exclusive appeal to pathos. Again, it's trying to make the reader feel ashamed, you know, with their first world lifestyle, in a sense. So look at that and making them feel ashamed. Now, its message may not be a bad message. It may not be a bad thing to stop and think about how your lifestyle versus the lifestyle of someone who's in a starving country differ and how maybe you ought to be moved to do something to make a difference in the lives of those who have that experience. But this meme is not the way of going about that. Making people feel ashamed doesn't move them to action. It doesn't move them to love their neighbor. It doesn't prompt them to go out and do good things. Shame doesn't do that. Good rhetoric could do that, but this isn't good rhetoric. That's just an exclusive appeal to pathos. So then ethos, exclusive appeals to ethos. I'm sure you've seen memes like this where it's got a picture of a figure, a quote, and then the name of that figure under the quote. Again, not argumentative. It's just the testimony of someone who is deemed authoritative on whatever topic they're speaking on. So whoever it might be. Now the two that I have here happen to be on the atheistic side, but we see Christian ones all the time. Just a quote thrown out by, oh, here's a quote from Tim Keller, or here's a quote from John Piper, or here's a quote from, and the quotes can be good, and sometimes the idea of the quote is just maybe it's encouragement. Maybe it's out there because it is some profound quote, and that's not a bad thing, but if this is your sole source of argumentation, you're not arguing. You're trying to be persuasive, but it's like that meme that we saw with uh, Morpheus from The Matrix, where he's saying, you know, there's more to atheism than just posting pictures with people saying things against religion. So you can see on there they each have their quotes saying something about how maybe there's a dichotomy between religion and science or you know those things are mutually exclusive or maybe it's saying something about what science is or what science truly is and how it's incompatible with religion. Which you guys have already gone through talks this week talking about how that's not really true. That there's not this distinct and establish incompatibility between those two things. But this is what I mean when I say a meme is just appealing to ethos. It just puts out a person, puts out a quote, and says, all right, take it. And if you don't listen to it, that means you're too stupid to believe the authority of this guy. So again, it's trying to intimidate you through this ethos. Another ethos one. I thought this one was just funny because look who it's attributed to. It's not attributed to the actor. It's attributed to the character. Spock said this in Star Trek, the motion picture. So first of all, they're not even appealing to a real person. They're appealing to a fictional character. So who they're really appealing to is whoever the screenwriter was who wrote, I guess, this line in the script. And it's going on. And of course, it is also, a, you know, a quote against God. But the idea is it's just pure ethos. But I thought that was kind of funny ethos because 
you know, the ethos of a fictional character versus a real person. But the other interesting thing is this is also appealing to pathos because many people who are huge fans of Star Trek have an emotional tie to that. This nostalgia, right? If you have nostalgic feelings towards something, whether it's Star Trek or something else, there's an emotional tie there. So this is appealing to the ethos of Spock based on your nostalgic emotional ties. Saying, oh, well, I, I love Spock. He's one of my favorite characters. You know, you're kind of thinking that and saying, well, I, I guess I should listen to him. And if I don't, then, you know, I'm defying the master of logical thinking. <sighs> I can't do that. So that's what it's doing, right? That's all of the subtle little things it's operating under this meme. Yes? You know, I, now you stop preaching and going to mental. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the other thing here is that, that is a, that's a picture of Spock from a different, it's not even contemporary. That's a picture of Spock from the TV series. Uh -huh. The quote is from the movie, which is which, because they're not quoting the actor, they're quoting the, the author. <coughs> right. And so you're using your, it, so it's, yeah, it's yeah. totally quote. So being able to critique these things is being able to start seeing what are the subtle underpinnings of everything going on in this meme. Finally learned what ethos, pathos, and logos are. <laughs> So maybe you've heard of them, but you didn't know what they were, but that's what they are. And most memes are leaving out the logos, just appealing to the pathos, the ethos, or both. And that's what most memes do. That's what most commercials do. I love, uh, some of my students will remember this, in logic class when we're talking about fallacies, I'll show some commercials. There's this great Pepsi commercial where uh, Michael Jackson comes on and does a, a dance. It's really entertaining. But the whole point of the commercial, they don't tell you anything about Pepsi. They don't tell you anything about the product. It's just this kid is trying to do some dance moves on the street. He's pretty good, but the kids are laughing at him. And then all of a sudden, Michael Jackson appears and dances with the kid. And now he's cool. And then they're drinking a Pepsi together. <laughs> That's it. Watch any commercial today. Ask yourself, what do they tell me about the product? The answer is going to be nothing. And then if you ask yourself, what emotion did they appeal to? <laughs> yeah, it, many of them. Usually, they're just trying to get you to feel good about it rather than explain to you why it is good. So, the last bit of equipping I want to give you. Evaluating persuasion. To learn if persuasion is being used well or poorly, you ask two questions. They're very simple questions. What are they trying to prove? And how are they trying to prove it? So what are they trying to prove? What is their point? What is their conclusion? How are they trying to prove it? What were they using? Were they just appealing to my emotions? Were they just appealing to the authority of some other figure? Or did they actually build an argument? Did they actually use all the components of good rhetoric to make that point? Ask yourself, what am I trying to prove and how am I trying to prove it? What's my point? Am I trying to prove it by intimidating or shaming the other person? Well, maybe I shouldn't do that. I should probably actually do the work to build a good argument. How am I trying to prove it? That's the big question. You can identify any fallacy by asking those two questions. What are they trying to prove and how are they trying to prove it? So remember that, remember that. There's all kinds of specific fallacies you can go on and learn, but if you can remember these two questions, you don't need to even know those. You can find fallacies yourself. So a fallacy is a commonly used faulty form of persuasion. It's a bad argument. So. <coughs> Uh, getting a little short on time, so what I'm going to do is I, I had a slide talking about specific fallacies. I'm going to skip that and skip a couple of those. And I just want to focus one more time on your attitude as we've learned these things. So hopefully now you have a good idea of what is an argument? What makes a good argument? What is rhetoric? What makes good rhetoric? How do I detect bad argumentation by saying what are they trying to prove? How are they trying to prove it? But ultimately you need to have an attitude of winsomeness. Love your neighbor. That's the commandment from Jesus. Jesus didn't say, go learn rhetoric, go learn logic, and police the world. That's not what his commandment was. His commandment was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If policing the world of bad logic and rhetoric is causing you to not love your neighbor well, then you are on the wrong path. But there are ways of taking these techniques that I've taught you and using them to love your neighbor. The first way is correcting your own reasoning. Reasoning well with your neighbor is the first way you can start loving your neighbor well. So remember that. So 
we must begin with our own faulty reasoning, trace your own faulty assumptions. So start thinking about beliefs that you hold and think about, well, why do I believe them? Why do I take this position on this issue rather than this position that my friend takes? Do I actually know why? If you don't know why, search out why. What are my reasons? Once you figure those out, are they good reasons? If they are, great. Now you can actually articulate those reasons to another person. If they're not good reasons, do good reasons exist to hold the position I've been holding? Or have I been operating under a false assumption and I need to correct that? Sometimes that means conceding. Again, it's not about winning arguments, it's about discovering truth. Sometimes in an argument, you are the one who is wrong and you need to concede. Very short uh, personal story and where I had to concede once, uh, and it's, it's funny how petty this issue is. I'm a huge fan of C.S. Lewis. Any other fans of C.S. Lewis in here? Have you read the Chronicles of Narnia? Raise your hand. <laughs> so I have very strong feelings about which order in which you ought to read those books. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if you're a huge fan of him, you probably know that they were published in a particular order, but now they're released, numbered in a different order. That they were published, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Silver Chair, The Horse and His Boy, um, The Magician's Nephew, The Last Battle. Now they're released in their chronological order. The Magician's Nephew, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Horse and His Boy, and then the rest follow pretty much the same. But where it really comes down to is which book do you start with? So I worked for a summer camp. This girl wanted to start reading the Chronicles of Narnia. I go and I grab The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and say, here, this is where you start. And she looked at it and said, but Mr. Buckles, this is book number two or book number three or whatever number it was. I said, trust me, start with this book. Because when I first read it, that's the order in which I read it, and since then I've read biographies of C.S. Lewis and read more about that book series and just have all kinds of reasons that I'm not going to share right now why I believe it is the way you should read it. Another one of the teachers at this same one said, no, 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 no. C.S. Lewis himself would advocate that you should read it in its chronological order. I said, what? What are you talking about? If that's what he wanted, he would have published them in that order. And I'd start, you know, vomiting out all of my reasons. <laughs> About a week later, my colleague comes up to me and he, he says, here, check this out. And on his phone, he's pulled up this web page and it's a letter from C.S. Lewis to a fan. Now, C.S. Lewis was actually very good about responding to fan mail back when he was around. And this is decades after he wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. And the fan's question was, I'm thinking about reading The Chronicles of Narnia, but I was wondering what order in which you would suggest I read them. And Lewis said in this letter, now if this letter is authentic and my colleague didn't go to great lengths to fabricate this, I trusted him. Lewis said, you know, I published them in this order, but actually since then, I would actually promote reading it in the chronological order. Lewis said that I, I actually prefer following the story in that way. And I'm, I was speechless, standing there thinking, no way, and my whole world is crashing in on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to concede. I said, all right. Lewis said it himself. Our argument was, what would Lewis advocate for? All right. The, uh, the conversation is over. I had to concede. I still advocate for reading it in the published order. <laughs> I, I, I said, and, and my colleague said, so you, then you would go against Lewis? I said, yes, I would. If he was in this room right now, I would explain to him <laughs> why he's wrong. <laughs> but... That aside, I had to concede, and I had to civilly concede. And it was a fun, you know, back and forth that we had for a week. But sometimes you have to concede, and that's okay. That is okay, especially on petty things like book order readings. So if it is appropriate to offer correction, this is the last little thought there. If it's appropriate to offer correction, do so gently and winsomely. Again, love your neighbor. You're trying to win the person, not the argument. So correction is about building someone up, not tearing someone down. So teach them. Pass along the tools that you've gained here today. Seek to correct privately, kindly, and instructively in such a way that the situation calls for. So sometimes it's not your place to offer correction to a particular person. Sometimes it's because you will be dishonoring them as your authority, or sometimes it's because you will be dishonoring your peer. So you need to think, 
is now an appropriate time to offer correction? Is there a better time that might come up later? We can privately have a conversation. Once you get to the point that the log is out of your own eye, once the log is out of your eye, then you will be ready. All right. So that's all I have. So I don't know if you want to give them a short break and I have some time for questions or if we want to just do questions now and then go. Jeremy? Yeah. Yes. So one thing that I was curious about, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were. Yeah. There's this, guy that, uh, there's this guy that I like to watch named Dr. Jordan Peterson. He's a professor of psychology over at the University of Ontario. And uh, uh -huh. he was, did like this two hour long talk, talk specifically on like the psychology behind Pepe uh, and Pepe the Frog. <laughs> and he, uh, it was actually fascinating. The conclusion that he came to is that the only purpose that it even exists is simply just to sow chaos, like not not, mm. to, not to even persuade. And so do memes have to be persuasive? Because I've seen ones that are just yeah. designed to offend people, ones ah. that are just designed to make people, you know, like, oh, that's like tell a joke. And mm -hmm. some that are just like, just create chaos. That's a good question. Memes don't have to be persuasive. They could just be entertaining. They could be persuasive or they could be using other purposes, like you said, just to offend. That they're not trying to alter the attitude, they're just trying to do harm. They're being used as a weapon. Um, and they're just trying to hurt other people. And that's, that's very likely. I've seen those. Yeah. Good question. Yes? Would you also agree that some memes are also taking light on some social issues by using jokes in them? Yeah. That's true. So it's interesting because I was talking about how they could be... Yeah, so he was saying, is it true that some memes could be making light of certain issues by, being, by making jokes out of them? And that's interesting because comedy, right? Comedy can be used for entertainment. Comedy can also be used for persuasion. Uh, do any of you watch stand-up comics? Get up and, you know, kind of do their thing. A lot of stand-up comics, I actually mention this to my rhetoric classes a lot, they are the master rhetoricians of our day. They know how to control an audience. They know how to get up there and they understand the people they're talking to. They know how to present their material just right, with the right timing, with the right wording, to get the laugh. But comedy you've got to be careful with. Um, and actually, C.S. Lewis talks about this in the Screw Tape Letters. And he talks about how there's different kinds of jokes. That there are jokes that can be actually quite edifying, that can be actually quite good for the soul, and you know, that, that are right. There are other jokes that are irreverent, jokes that do make light of serious issues, and by doing that, it actually does much harm. That it causes us to love our neighbor less. It causes us to see an issue that is very evil, but instead of necessarily uh, regarding it, as evil and hating it, we are laughing about it as if it's not as serious as it really is. Uh, so that is something to be very careful about that whether it's a meme or whether it's anything else or whether it's even us just joking with our friends, uh, you know, we've got to be careful. Uh, you know, when we joke, those kind of irreverent jokes can end up doing great harm in our attitude towards something that we ought to be despising perhaps. Yes? Can jokes ever go too far? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so joking, and again, I'm not against joking, I'm not against memes, it's just good things get abused. Good things like memes, good things like jokes, they get abused, and they get warped, and they get used as tools of the enemy, rather than tools for the Lord. So that's what you've got to be careful about, that God created things as good, but man finds w new ways to twist it and warp it into all kinds of you know, different perverted things. Yes? Um, how do we gently address the issues of, say, political memes that may be influencing how someone thinks, like for instance, uh, Hillary Clinton <coughs> holding a bong and Ted Cruz is the Zodiac Killer? <laughs> <laughs> so my main point here today, the place to start, is thinking about the kind of memes that you're sharing. So thinking about how am I using memes? Am I trying to use them as my primary mode of persuasion? 
or am I actually trying to delve into these issues face to face with people and you know really cr get into real discussions? Now, what other people do, especially on social media, you can't always control really. You can't really control and oftentimes can hardly even speak into or find an appropriate situation to speak into it. So I think one of the best things to consider is do we give approval though? You know, are there people that we follow or are there people that, uh, that we support on social media that are, are, um, that are perpetuating these bad argumentations and are we giving our approval to that? I think it's interesting, there's this wording, I think it's in Romans, where there's this little clause where it, uh, Paul is talking about how man you know, is an inventor of evil and finding all kinds of different ways to do all these different abominations and other people giving approval to it. I always thought that was really interesting how Paul says, yeah, doing the evil is bad, but giving approval to the evil is also very, very bad. You know, sitting aside and, and clapping your hands when the other is do doing the abomination, whether it's, you know, a, a poor meme or otherwise. Uh, so I think that's, you know, usually there's not really going to be an appropriate situation where you kind of can pull someone aside or comment on their feet. Usually I find commenting on someone, that doesn't work ever. Uh, again, not listening. People don't really listen and people don't really read what other people are saying. They just shout back, unfortunately. It's a very sad state of things. Yes? I forgot about that. Good. That's the interesting section. <laughs> so affirmative, negative, interesting. Basically, if there's relevant information, and you, so there's information regarding the issue, and you know it's relevant, but you can't decide, is it supporting the affirmative or is it supporting the negative? It's a placeholder. You say, okay, I'm going to stick it over there because I know that bit of information is going to come up and it's going to be important. Or I know that information is there, but I can actually see it in some ways supporting the affirmative side and other ways supporting the negative side. I'm not sure where it's going to fall. I'm going to stick it over here. So it's that extra space for information that doesn't fit in the other two columns. Good question. Yes? I was wondering what you thought about that. Interesting. Dried up anger. So I think sarcasm comes from people for many different reasons. Uh, I tend to believe that all sarcasm has a nugget of truth at the root of it. Um, that no matter how over the top sarcastic they're making it to be, it is still growing out of a real feeling that that person feels, um, whether it's anger or maybe some other kind of feeling. So I, I think on many levels I would agree with that, but I think it can be even more complicated than just being anger. It could be disappointment, it could be regret, it could be resentment, uh, or it could be even a positive feeling sometimes too. Yeah, it's interesting. Some memes aren't meant to be jokes, and I think the ones that we were talking about there are ones that weren't necessarily meant to be joking, but just meant to be offensive, just meant to be harmful. Um, now jokes, if jokes aren't meant to be taken seriously, I don't know if I would state that particularly. That I think, you know, again, there are different kinds of jokes, and uh, there are jokes that are you know, just for cheap entertainment kind of thing, just, you know, a real easy kind of joke. There are some jokes that really make you think, some jokes that really make you have to stop and reflect and contemplate. So some jokes, I think, ought to be taken seriously, the ones that are trying to get you to stop and reflect. But the other jokes that are just kind of cheap, you know, maybe those aren't to be taken as seriously. But it's, I think it's hard to articulate. There's a much larger discussion I think we could have on this. Again, C.S. Lewis keeps popping into my head. He says that joy is the serious business of heaven, which I always thought was interesting. That quote always makes me stop and think, um, and that there is joy in humor, there is joy in jokes, and it can bring much goodness, but it can also do much harm. But there's a lot of complexity there that I don't think we have time right now to get into. But I wouldn't necessarily say that you shouldn't take jokes seriously. You can take jokes seriously and have fun with them. You can take something seriously and have joy with it. So for instance, it was mentioned that, 
you know, I enjoy being part of theatrical productions. And we do a Shakespeare play every year at our school. I take that very seriously. Any actors that I've worked with will tell you, yeah, Mr. Buckles, he comes over here and tells me, no, you've got to fix this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And I take it seriously because I'm passionate about it being amazing. And I see the potential in the student, and I go up there and with full force say, this is what you've got to do to do your very best. And that's taking it seriously, but that's not taking it lightly, and it's not robbing the fun out of it either. I hope not. I hope I'm not robbing the fun <laughs> from the student's experience. Uh, yes? Yeah, jokes in essence fly or fall depending on who your audience is. And that's why I said that a the best rhetoricians are stand-up comics because they know their audience so well. They know these people that they've never met. And a lot of times they have a very artful craft. They'll have a few opening jokes that are just to feel out the audience to see what they're responding to. And then the rest of their set will follow from what they've received from the audience. So they'll have a bunch of different tracks ready to go see who this audience is, say, okay, we're going this way because that's what they like, that's who they are. So they fly or fall depending on who you're with. Yes? Uh, okay, so you talk about, like, in some situations people will not be able to be convinced, like, because mm. But if you're having this, an, uh, debate, I guess you could call it, argument with somebody, and uh, you also talk about, talk about attitude, and they just have a really bad attitude about it, mm -hmm. but So I think, you know, you should, if you really feel convicted that you ought to have this conversation with someone, it's good to initiate that. But there will probably come a point that you may realize they're not going to hear it. Maybe they're just not ready to hear it right now, or maybe they're not going to hear it from me. Maybe they need to hear it from someone else. Sometimes you might be too close to them or too close to the situation that they're not going to hear it from you. It's very hard. I'm not going to say that that's easy. I've had plenty of conversations with people that I love dearly and realize they're not going to hear this truth from me. Pray for them. Just pray. Um, and know, you know, I think the best example I love is in the Gospels, Jesus. He's going around and he is speaking truth to people. He got one of two responses. They either came up and said, I want to give my whole life to you. I want to follow you. I want to go everywhere with you. Or they started picking up rocks and throwing them at him. And the only reason he didn't get stoned that day was because apparently he was a really fast runner and a really good hider. <laughs> But you see, he got one of two responses, right? They either gave themselves over to him or they tried to kill him. And that wasn't any fault of Jesus, right? He was perfect and he spoke perfectly and he spoke honestly. The problem was with the other individuals who were rejecting the truth. And that's something that you can't always help. And that's when you pray because you need the spirit to move in their life. Yeah. Yes. Very good. So I would say uh, the textbook that we use at my school I really like. It's called Introductory Logic. And that particular one, it's uh, by James Nance, N-A-N-C-E. I'm going to write this. Introductory Logic, James Nance, and Doug Wilson are the authors. That is a good introduction into it, and it's a workbook, and it's got worksheets that you can do, and it introduces you to the fine mechanics of logic. Rhetoric, actually, a good book that just came out this year, also by James Nance, is called Fitting Words, also by James Nance. I think those would be good for you to, you can go through those yourself, actually, honestly. I go through this book with a class of eighth grade students, but many of you, uh, you know, you're in later high school, I think you could pick it up and work through it on your own. Now, the lessons are pretty concise, very easily digestible, logic, and then rhetoric. He goes through basically everything Aristotle has to say on rhetoric and breaks it down really nicely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we got enough time for one more question. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, do you think we should be able to joke about anything? Joke about anything? I would not say that, no. 
um, because there is real evil in the world. And there is real wickedness. And there are things that God hates. And I don't think we should joke about things that we ought to hate as God hates. That we ought to love the things that, that God loves, and we ought to you know, seek to love that which is holy and be holy as he is holy. But uh, I think it's very dangerous to joke about things that are um, wicked because it can cause our attitude to make light of those things, kind of like was said before, and to not see our enemy as one who is out to steal, kill, and destroy, but as, as one who is maybe not that dangerous, as one who is maybe not that serious about destroying us. That, you know, the devil's not out to give you a bad day. He wants to destroy you, to steal, to kill, and not just to kill, but to wipe you out. And that's serious. That's something that's very serious. And, and the reason I speak so seriously on it is because I'll confess that I, you know, for a long time was a very irreverent joker. Uh, because I, I love humor. I love cracking jokes. But you've got to be careful. Um, and uh, so that's what I'd say to that. I think we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs>